John chapter 1, and uh, <clears throat> I want to read beginning at verse number 7. John chapter 1, and verse number 7. There came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Everybody say light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Everybody say light. That was the true light. There's a difference in light and true light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh. Man, I like you, buddy. You're all right. Amen. Did you guys get that just for me? <laughs> all right. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Some people say they thank the Lord for light, but we need to thank the Lord for true light. No marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If you think the devil's coming with a red suit and a pitchfork and pointed tail, I hate to tell you, he's not coming that way. He's coming as light. He's coming as light. And his, his messengers are coming as light which I assume they're coming under the banner of Christianity. Well, that didn't go over real well for some reason. But we're talking about the true light tonight. And there is a difference between the light and the true light. Satan has to transform into light, but God is light. And there's no shadow of turning, and he's the word. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight about the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, we're going to, tonight and tomorrow night, we're going to stay along the same theme. And we want the Lord to talk to us. We're going to talk a little bit about what I feel like the Holy Ghost is doing in the world right now. And what we need to expect the Holy Ghost to do. Everybody here tonight? Amen. You know, we can expect the Holy Ghost to do some things. And it's his desire to do these things, and we need to be in tune with it. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us, shall we? Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful presence. Thank you for these people that have gathered, Lord. We ask for a special anointing upon this meeting. We know... We know, God, that when people come together in unity, that there is a commanded blessing there. We pray for that cascading flow of anointing and that commanded blessing to come. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Open our understanding, our spirits, and our minds. We give you the glory for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you clap your hands before you're seated. You got a little more praise left in you tonight? I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. You may be seated. You ever really looked at that verse? I heard people quote that, I'll bless the Lord all the time. Well, that's a little hard to do all the time. It doesn't say all the time. Boy, it got quiet, didn't it? I will bless the Lord at all times. If you want to do a really interesting study, go to the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. Find out what all things have a time for. So it's easy to bless the Lord when something's being born, but can you bless him when something dies? I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I was looking for you. Weren't you sitting up here last year up here? I remember you. 
I got a little video clip of you over there dancing around, getting all happy. I, I'm glad to see you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I don't want to cross your theology here tonight, and I definitely don't want to come across anti-evangelism. Because if you know anything about me, you will know that I'm a strong advocate for reaching our world with this, as far as I'm concerned, only saving message. Yes, sir. I'm one God. I believe in one Lord. I believe in one faith. I believe in one baptism. I think that there is one God who is above all, through all, and in us all. I really do. I believe Acts 2.38 is the saving message. And I realize that if it is the saving message, then we need to examine everything that we are doing to make sure the world hears that message. Praise God. I told you when I started tonight, I didn't just say it at random. I believe the Lord's coming. I really do. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I want to I wanna just share a couple of things with you tonight and hopefully set the stage for the weekend. I, I believe that the Holy Ghost is going to visit with us in a very special and unique way this weekend. Amen. I believe that because of timing, doesn't it? It's not a matter of who's preaching. It's a matter of timing. And folks, I'm telling you, there's some things that are shaping up and happening in the world and in the spirit realm that we need to be keen to and that we need to understand. I, uh, <clears throat> I know what it's like to feel a guilt on the fact that I've not stood on a street corner seven days a week, 24 hours a day, preaching the gospel. I can remember leaving one time. I was going through a little trial. I can remember leaving my brother pastors in southern Los Angeles area. And I remember leaving southern California and driving back to San Francisco. And by the time I got home, the enemy had beat me down so bad over the fact all these millions of people and what are you really doing about it? Now, if it doesn't bother you to look at the masses, we, uh, you know, every time a plane banks and I get ready to land in a metro area somewhere or an area where there's people, I'm moved by the fact that we have a great responsibility. I'm starting a little slow. Just hang on with me here. We have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. You can put it on somebody else, but we all share that responsibility. If we are the body of Christ, we share that responsibility. And, uh, but I'm just going to be real honest with you. If you look at the numbers, we're in trouble. If you look at the percentages, we're in trouble. I think somewhere in the United States, we have less than 1% of the population that attends an apostolic church. That's the, that's the attendance that we take on Easter, which is inflated numbers. I did a study one time of trying to reach the Bay Area. I took our Sunday school attendance on Easter, and I took 15 people. If we were to reach, or if we took 15 people out of those numbers, and we used them to evangelize, which would be a pretty safe deal, I figured up it would take us about 150 years. Now, let me back up. If each one of us in our numbers witnessed to 15 people, it would take us 150 years to reach 
the Bay Area of California alone. Have I got you depressed yet? <laughs> we have a great responsibility. We look at different avenues, different venues and all, and I think that God has given us some great tools. And uh, personally, I'm glad for the Internet. I know the Antichrist is going to use it in the end time to rule the world. But I say let's just beat him with it first. Let's use it and get everything out of it that we can before he takes it over. Praise God. I say, where in the world are you going? Just hang on here. Hopefully I'm not too jet lagged. I'll think my way out of this here in a second. Amen. <laughs> I, uh, I, I realize that we have a tremendous responsibility. I'm not, I'm not negating on that. I'm not trying to get away from that responsibility. Matter of fact, if you'll wait and let me get to the end of the sermon, I will validate our responsibility. But a few months ago, I was praying about all this, and... Uh, this is what come to me. Now, you judge it if it was God or not. But this is what come to me. Do you really think that I left someone's salvation in your hands alone? Now, really think about it. The chances, the chances of somebody meeting you or coming in contact with you chances of it. It's pretty slim. And the fact is, is if we think that we are the great evangelist, I need to remind us who the greatest evangelist is. Right. Yes, sir. It's called the Holy Ghost. Yes. Well, that went over real well. <clears throat> it's called the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> I'm not opposed to evangelism. We have it in our local church. We're going to have it. We're going to push it. We're going to, we're going to do it. But I think that we need to get a little understanding about how this is supposed to work. First of all, the scripture says that no man cometh to the Father save the Spirit draw him. Now, if you think you found God because you got a high enough IQ, I hate to tell you, you're badly mistaken. If you think you found God, I hear people testify, I found the Lord. I hate to tell you, you didn't find him. He found you. He found you. <clears throat> It's not like all of a sudden you just, something happened and you decide, I'm going to go find God. But there was a drawing process. No man cometh to the Father, save the Spirit, draw him. You didn't even know at hardly what was going on when it started. You were sitting there, well, I don't know how to talk about Australia, but in the States we'd say something like this. You were sitting at the club. Or at the bar, or with somebody else's wife, or husband, or maybe same sex. And all of a sudden, something started in your spirit. You didn't even know what was going on at the time. Now, we used to call it conviction. And I think that we need some old fashioned conviction. <clears throat> And I think that old-fashioned conviction needs to work a little godly sorrow. Because if godly sorrow has its part, you'll come to repentance. And I feel like preaching here just a little bit. I mean, you, 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 you are living it up and having a great life. Or maybe, maybe it's messed up. I don't know. Maybe God messed it up. Maybe you thought somebody else messed up your life. Maybe it was God messing it up for you. I don't know if I believe that. We'll go back and ask Saul, the first king of Israel. He thought he had it made. He had his donkeys on the farm, the mules on the farm. Everything was fine. Then one day they wandered off somewhere. 
He went looking for them, thinking, I got to go find them, man. That's my security. That's the way I make a living. That's my farming equipment. I got to go find them. And he went to find them, and he couldn't find them. And finally, a servant asked him, he said, hey, there's a prophet over here by the name of Samuel. Why don't we go in there and ask him if he's seen those mules? He went in there, and he asked him, he said, oh, yeah, man, the mules, they went home two days ago. They're done back at the farm. But by the way, God has anointed you to be king over his inheritance and captain over his inheritance. So if you don't believe that God knows how to mess with your stuff, are y'all listening to me here right now? God knows exactly how to mess with your, I feel like preaching right here. God knows exactly how to mess with your stuff. He knows how to mess with your security. He knows how to mess with your job. He knows how to mess with your family. I don't think God will do that. You better believe God will do that. He'll do it to get your attention. He'll mess with you and he'll stir things up and he'll stir up your security. And all you think is if I could just get that back, I'd be all right. God says, I got news for you. You're never going to go back to the farm the same way. Woo. I'm fixing to put an anointing on your life that you don't even understand. And I'm talking to somebody that came to turning point with your stuff being messed up. Something stirring and you don't understand it. And you're just trying to go, I just want to pray and go back. Man, I don't know why I'm here. You know, here, here's the deal. We all want God to come heal something. And sometimes God doesn't want to heal it. You know, oh, come on, Jesus, come heal Lazarus. Just, just come heal him. He's your friend. I mean, he supports your ministry. He sends twenty nine ninety five a month to your ministry. You need to come. <laughs> I forgot. I'm not in the States. Amen. You, you need to come do something. Jesus sat down and waited. He stopped and waited. And then when he got the news, hey, Lazarus is asleep. They said, well, that's good. If he's asleep, that means he's mending. He's getting better. He's recovering. Jesus said, I don't mean that kind of sleep. I mean, he's dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. Boy, if Jesus feels that way about the people he loves, I sure don't want him as my enemy. <laughs> Amen. All right. He said, hey, let's go on down there. I'm going to take care of this. Now, remember, the only thing they were asking for was for a healing, and God let him die. Did you let me tell you why he let him die? You ready for this one? If he heals something, he can only restore it back to its original state. Amen. But if he resurrects something according to the scripture, anything he resurrects is always better. Better. And so sometimes, sometimes you want God to come heal a situation. I've had church problems before. I wanted God to come heal. I've had situations I wanted God to come heal. And God said, I'm not in, in, interested in healing it. I want it to die. You just need to go ahead and die out because I want to resurrect this into something better. And I'm talking to somebody that came to this conference with your stuff all messed up and you're expecting God to heal it. I got news for you. You don't need God to heal it. You need God to resurrect something and God to bring life into something that will be better. Now, 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 I'm getting all sidetracked here. Now, here's the deal, folks. I, I want to show you. Now, I, I, I want to, I, I, I might as well just jump into this. That verse of Scripture started really intriguing me. For this is the true light that cometh into the world, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, Calvinists have a little predestination deal. Well, you've got a little trouble with that verse. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. Now, are y'all still with me? Everybody okay? There's no refunds here tonight. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Here's the deal. He lieth every man, the true light, yeah. that lieth every man that cometh into the world. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is it possible for every 
person born, at some point in time in their life, a light comes on. Nobody's witness to you. Nobody's handed you a tract. Nobody's taught you a Bible study. Nobody's invited you to a crusade. Hmm. Do you really think that you got your understanding of who Jesus Christ is, the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, because you, you just put the dots together? The Bible teaches us that all things returns to its source. The scripture also tells us that God has given to every man a measure of faith, the measure of faith. I really believe that in every human being born, that there's a measure of something in them that God put in them. And at some point in time, will you let me preach what I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight? And at some point in time, that something in them turns to its source. Mm. I believe that every human being born at some point in time, I'll give you a case scenario. You ready for it? Uh, a few years ago, we had just south of San Francisco, matter of fact, we live, well, you can look at our bed, back room and see a little town or a city called San Bruno, California. And the fact is there was a Buddhist temple there, and within about a two-week period of time, there was five Buddhist monks that either by vision or by dream had Jesus Christ appear to them, tell them what his name was, who he was, and that he was one. Now, nobody, nobody had witnessed to him. Nobody had got to him. Now, people got to him later and messed the whole thing up. Mm. But the fact is that nobody, somebody said, man, you're supposed to be preaching really exciting. I'll get there. Just hang on. <laughs> nobody had got to these monks at that point in time. I preached this sermon the other night, and I don't think it's just a sermon. I think it's something that the Holy Ghost is getting ready to do. And I had a, I had a man email me, and he said, I want you to go and order this book. So I went online and ordered it. The man has documented cases among the nation of Islam of people all of a sudden by the thousands without a missionary, without anybody getting to them, all of a sudden revelation starting to come to them and the light comes on because he is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Praise God. Folks, if you knew what was about to happen, you'd be shouting right now. You'd be running the aisles, and you'd be shouting right now. Now, I realize, I realize you're sitting there saying, oh, well, man, that's great. That takes the pressure off of us. Not really. I'm going to show you a couple things. You got time for this? Can, can we put some verses up there? Is that 2 Corinthians chapter 3? And uh, I want you to go to verse number 18. And then we're going to go into chapter 4. Everybody still good? Everybody okay? Yeah. Everybody good? Yeah. You still awake? Yeah. Sister Morgan, you still awake over there? I think it's about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Everybody, everybody really okay? All right, you're having a good time? All right, all right. But we all with open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Or what? We're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, prior to that, Paul's telling everybody, listen, these people, these Hebrew people had trouble because Moses, when he come off the mountain, he had a veil over his face. Now, most people say he had a veil over because of the glory of God, which is, which is true. But there's more to it than just hiding the glory of God. If you read 2 Corinthians 3, you'll find out that God did not want the Hebrew people associating a fading glory with the law. God knew that the glory on Moses' face was going to fade. 
And so anytime there's a fading glory, he wanted it to be veiled. The fact is, I just want you to listen to this. Any church, any congregation, any organization that has a fading glory has to create veils to hide the fact that the glory of God is not as strong in our midst as it used to be. And we try all sorts of stuff, and I'm not opposed, just listen to me, but we think marketing, we think gimmicks, we think light shows, we think all that stuff is going to hide the fact that there's something fading in the, fading in the glory department. I got news for you, the best show on the earth is the Holy Ghost show. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Matter of fact, if you study out the scripture when Lucifer would go before the throne of God, it, these, these stones that he had, God, which is light, which I'm talking about tonight, would hit those stones. Luc or, do you know this? Lucifer, when he moved, you could hear a tambourine and a pipe playing. It was a part of his workmanship. In other words, any time he moved, you could hear music playing. And it was his responsibility to lead the angelic host before the throne of God. And when he would leave them with the worship and the music and the angels of God would come rejoicing before the throne of God, the light of God would hit those stones as his covering and it would filter through heaven like a brilliant light show. That's why Ezekiel said, because of thy brilliance, Iniquity was found in thee. You are a reflector of God's glory. And you decided that you wanted the glory. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, there's no glory like the glory of God. There's nothing in a church or a meeting like the glory of God. You cannot outshine the glory of God. No, no, and just listen, listen, here's the deal. Now, now, now. So here's the deal. They, they, uh, let's get to it here. They got this veil. And what Paul's actually teaching and preaching there is, is that that veil's been removed. Everybody says it's been removed. Can I pick on you a little bit? I think it's clean. I'm supposed to be blowing my nose on this one and using this one to wipe sweat. So I'm going to put this one in my pocket, all right? So I think we're going to be okay. And what he's saying is, is, here's Moses, and God says, look, I don't want you seeing that fading glory. And, uh, but with Christ, is what Paul's trying to teach is, that veil's been removed. There's nothing to hide it. Stay with me now. And that's three, go back to three and 18. That's three and 18. It's all going to make sense here in a minute, I hope. Now, when he gets into that, he says, and we are all changed. Isn't that what it says? And we're all changed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, what people don't understand is, is you need the revelation of Jesus Christ because without the revelation of Jesus Christ, you don't know who you are. And the fact is, is when you see the revelation of Jesus Christ, and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the scripture says that you are to change. I think I taught on this here last year about sonship. You are to change from glory to glory. Now, the reason why a lot of churches have trouble with people changing is because they have no real revelation of Jesus Christ or no real glory being made manifest. Because it's the glory of God and the Holy Ghost that becomes the changing agent with people. Mm. Are, are you okay? You still okay? Now, if you're sitting in church and you hadn't been changed, you got a veiled glory. Either you put a veil, well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 1. You, you sure you're okay, everybody? Some of you don't look happy right now. I, I don't know what to do for you. I, there's no popcorn, folks. I'm sorry. There's no popcorn. Now, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not. Verse 2. 
but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking craft and handing the word of God deceitfully. You know, you know what Paul just said here? Let me just help you save you about four years of Bible school. You know what Paul just said right there? He said, we didn't come to you like the serpent. The actual translation says, we did not come to you like the serpent. We came in total honesty. We didn't water that. Matter of fact, one translation says, we didn't dilute the word of God like you would dilute wine with water. We didn't dilute it. We gave it to you straight. Now, back oh, up here, sorry. But by the manifestation truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience on the side of God. He said, we believe what we've taught you so strong that we are willing to stand with your conscience when you stand before God. That's how sure we are of the word of God that we've taught you. Now, let's get to verse number three because here's where it really gets interesting. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. This is more like a Bible study, isn't it? Hid to them that are lost. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Now, the fact is you could take that term hid and the same Greek word is veil. And Paul's still on this veil. That's what people don't understand. Paul's still talking about the veil. If our gospel be veiled, it is veiled to them or hid to them that are lost. Let's find out how that happens. Let's go to the next verse. Hey, it's going to get fun here in a second. And whom the God of this world blinded the minds of them, which what? Which believe not. Lest the what? The light, the light of what? Glory. The glorious gospel of Christ. Whew, I feel a little one God coming on. Come on, come on. The light who is what? Who is the what? Who is the image of God? That's what Paul's trying to tell you in verse chapter 3, verse 18. He said, listen, when it come to Jesus, he didn't have a veil. You can see his face. Man, I like that because Moses, the one that had the veil over his face, he's the one that wanted to see the face of Jesus Christ on the mountain. And God said, I can't show him my face. Face doesn't exist yet. He hasn't been born yet. I can show you my hinder parts. But that don't mean that God showed Moses his backside where people preach it. It meant he showed him the past. I can show you the past, but I can't show you the future because the future's not here yet. He does not exist yet. He will be the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the fact that he will be begotten means he has a moment of conception. Woo. Who is the image of God should shine unto them. Oh, hang on, it's going to get better. Let's go to the next verse. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and our servants, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse number six. For God who commanded, there it is. Somebody ought to shout right now. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. I like those verses. I like it. It said in, the, in John 1, and the darkness comprehended it not. It don't mean that the darkness didn't achieve it mentally, that it understood it. The word comprehend means it could not, it could not wrestle it away. It could not subdue it. Because when God decided, man, I could preach right now. Most Adam had a great relationship with God, as far as I'm concerned, walked in the light of God. But the moment that he got separated from God, he got separated from light. And now he's got a veil. He can't see God like he's seen him when he was walking with him in the cool of the day. He plummets over here into spiritual darkness. God said the day that you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. And he did die. He died spiritually. And when he died spiritually, the lights went off. And God said, find me. Now what you enjoyed before, find me now. Oh, by the way, I'm going to help you on how to find me. Watch how I kill this animal. It's called worship. Why do you think he didn't have any respect for the boy's offering? Because he did not follow the order of God. God said, the only way that any man or woman's ever really going to search me out or to get on the right avenue is they have to come through worship. Worship, worship, worship. I ain't got time to get that. Worship. 
Now here's what happened. Every time there was a prophecy in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah, you ready for it? A light come on. Boom. A candle. That's why we talk about the Old Testament as shadows and types. It's because those people could vaguely see. They had just a little bit of light, and they could vaguely see into the future and see shapes and forms and shadows of things to come. But when Christ was born, when the fullness of time came and Christ was born of a woman, the Bible lets you know the light switch come on. Boom. And God said, here he is. Here he is. God have mercy. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and what? Where is it at? Paul hadn't changed his message. In the face of Jesus Christ. That veil come off. And we can see the face of Jesus Christ. Which reveals to us the glory of God. This is the. We okay still? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the most important revelation there is. Our world needs this revelation. Now, now, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Let's go back to this, all right? So here's somebody. I want to ask you a question. What happens to the man that God turns, this, the light comes on, revelation comes, and you choose by your unbelief not to believe it? You're just like Israel. You didn't want to believe, so I'll put a veil over it. I'll darken your understanding. Are, are you with me here? This is what happened. See, everybody at some point in time, now I'm going to go back to my statement, at some point in time in their life, something happens. I, I can't really explain it all, but something happens. It really does. Something happens. Now they've got to make a choice. Now they either have to accept the revelation or they reject the revelation. God have mercy. I, 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 I want you to just listen to me. I know we're going a little slow here tonight. I want you to listen to me. They have to make a choice. They either accept the revelation or they reject the revelation. If they accept the revelation, then it's like, a, it's like an effect. Other stuff starts coming. Other things start happening. Now, I want to ask you guys a question. Where in the world do you think Paul got all this? I'm asking, where do you think he got it? He got the Holy Spirit, but he got it by his own personal experience with God. He's got letters in his pockets. He's a devout Jew. I mean, he gave his credentials. He's a devout Jew. He's on his way down to kill some more folks, or at least put them in prison. He's on his way to Damascus. Does anybody know what happens on the road of Damascus? A light. Poof. Knocks him off his horse. Here's, the, here's, here's where the true light comes. Now, if light comes to you and it does not answer the same way it answered to Paul, you got the wrong light. And he's laying flat on his back in this blinding light, and he asks the question. Now, you got to understand, he's a Jew. Since he was about that high or even younger, he had been taught one thing for sure. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is. And so looking into that light, he asked that question, Who art thou, Lord? You know what he just asked? Who are you, Elohim? Who are you, El Shaddai? Who are you, Jehovah? Who are you? And a voice spake back and said, now watch him, he's a Jew. Remember, he's a Jew. And those Jews, they had a little problem at that point in time because they had a veil over something. And as long as Paul was breathing threatenings against the church, as long as he was still under the law, he had that veil. But God's about to move that veil for the apostle Paul. He said, listen, what the law couldn't show you, I'm about to show you. 
And when that veil come off to the apostle Paul, this is what was responded. I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. I am the image of the invisible God. You will see the glory of God in my face. My God have mercy. And he's looking into that blinding light and he gets the revelation of who God really is. I'm Jesus. Woo! I'm Jesus. Now, I'm not one to offend anybody here. He didn't say I'm the second person of the Trinity because the question was, who art thou, Lord? We want to know who the God of the Old Testament is. You've got to be dealing with me. What in the world's going on? Is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? Listen, you think you're doing the right thing by attacking on all the stuff, this little infant deal over here. But I got news for you. You're, you're attacking me. Now, let's finish that story. And I'll try to start wrapping this up. Don't get too happy. <laughs> now he's a little blind, and they have to lead him. Come on. And they lead him down to a street called Straight. I was old time Pentecost, I'd preach about the street called Straight. Sit down. God said, now you hang right here. I got somebody coming to tell you what you ought to do. And he reaches over here and got Ananias over here praying. And God says, Ananias. I need you to go witness to somebody. And Ananias like, yes, Lord, tell me who it is. <laughs> Saul of Tarsus. Oh, read it in there. Oh, we've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I need you to go to him, watch him, for he is a chosen vessel. And the light has already done its job. He's not going to be so tough right now. <laughs> Head on down there. Now, don't you listen? And the rest is history. Ananias goes and visits Saul. And when he walked in, you know what he said? Hey, brother Saul. He already knew if the light had done his job. Hey, Brother Saul, I've come to tell you what you ought to do. Now, somewhere in telling him what he ought to do, we know he got, had to tell him about being baptized. He prays for him, the scales falls off of his eyes. I mean, the great miracle happens. Now, do you, I want to ask you a question. How effective do you think Ananias would have been if that light hadn't already done its job. Now here's where we're getting in trouble. We're trying to reach people that the light's never even visited yet. Can I pick on you a little bit? It's kind of like, come on now. You're going to church and you're going to go down. You okay? All right. Sometimes I don't know my own strength, you know, kind of. And you're going to go down there and bless God, you're going to going to do what? What if the father's not even drawn him yet? What if the light hasn't even started dawning on him yet? Do you really think that you got enough tricks to what? To what? Sister, I'm asking this question. To what? Do you think that you're the, you're, you, you alone, without the help of the Holy Ghost, you think you got any chance to reach him or to get to him? Abs uh, you've got to be more intelligent than that. It's human. Now, I know a lot of us that try it. 
Well, when are you going to get to it? I'm getting there. Our responsibility is to be like Ananias and find where the light's shining and get to these people and tell them what they ought to do. Now, we're glad that you got the revelation, but now let us start telling you a little bit more about who Jesus is. Listen, do you think those Buddhist monks had all figured out in San Bruno just by a dream or revelation? No, but God got their attention. Now, this is where the church comes in. This is where the power of witness comes in. Hang on now, right here. Wouldn't it be more effective if our evangelism was spirit-led? You know, the only way to know how to do it is kind of like. Come on, sit down. I'm fixing them. Well, the Holy Ghost is. Now, let me tell you what's about to happen. See, we're sitting here thinking Brother Morgan's just kind of, he's just kind of meandering. We'd say meandering. Maybe I shouldn't say that here. I don't know. It may mean something bad. I don't know. He just kind of fooled around or whatever. But here's the facts. When we're sitting here, there's a verse of Scripture being fulfilled. And that verse of Scripture is that Israel is blinded in part. When Jesus Christ came to Israel to reveal himself and they rejected him, when the light come on to that nation and they rejected him. Now, here's what I want to tell you. It's hard for us to understand, but God moves some things beyond just an individual or a community. He moves it to a nation. And there's times that God deals with nations. My God. You're going to be judged in eternity. Nations are judged in time. And God is going to deal with nations. Now, that's hard for us to understand, but God deals with nations. Now, the key to all of this is, is understanding, and this is what I want to talk about tomorrow night, understanding when that time comes. But the fact is, Israel, when he came and revealed who he was to them, and they said, Ah, let his blood be on us and on our kids. We refuse to accept the light that's come on. This is not how we thought our Messiah was going to appear. Folks, I got news for you. Even Simon Peter had a hard time believing. Now, you can, you can say how horrible he was at the fire when he betrayed Jesus, but the fact is, at that point in time, he didn't know who Jesus was. He had it all figured out in his mind. And this was the way most of the Jews had it figured out. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to resurrect an army. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And those boys thought Peter, James, and John, all of them, were on the ground floor. Bless God, we're right in here with them. We're going to be generals in his army and all. And Peter proved to him when he pulls his sword in the garden, do you think he was just trying to nick that high priest here? He's trying to cut his head off. He's proven to Jesus, I'm willing to die for you. You're going to the throne, and I'm going to show you that I'm capable to handle this. And when Jesus turned to him and said, put your sword up, it messed everything up in Simon Peter's preconceived idea as to how the Messiah was supposed to come. And I want you to listen to me. We all sitting in here, we think we got it all figured out. And we don't. So listen, when the light comes on, it's a different story. Now, Israel is blinded in part. Anybody know Romans chapter 11, verse 25, about a mystery? Israel is blinded in part, not completely all of them, but they're blinded in part. Until, watch me now, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. And all Israel shall be saved. Let me tell you what I see in the spirit. I see the Gentile nations moving toward 
the final revelation of Jesus Christ among the Gentile nations. They are going to choose either to accept it or to reject it. They're going to. They're going to. And the sad fact is, is a lot of the Gentile nations are going to reject it. Are you listening to me? And they're going to become just as hard-hardened. They're going to become just as blind because when the revelation comes, if you choose not to believe it, you, it becomes hid. It becomes veiled to you. Let me tell you what's about to happen. Whether we understand it or not, I, I, don't, I don't know how far to get in this. Acts chapter 12, Peter's in prison. The people are praying. As far as I can see, Peter in prison is a perfect type of the end time. Because Herod, which is a type of the Antichrist, he gives a speech later and they said it's the voice of a God, not a man. And God has to kill him. And the next thing you know, Peter's in prison, and he's bound by Herod. And he's got all these guards and people around him. And the scripture says that the church prayed without ceasing. And when the angel of God finally got to him, the first thing that happened in that prison cell was a light shone. And it's moments before Easter. Acts chapter 12, it uses the term Easter. Easter's the resurrection, and the resurrection is a type of the rapture. And so moments before the rapture of the church, there's going to be an angel of light that comes to the world. And he's, he's, he's bringing light to the world. And when he brings that light into prison cells, the light switch is going to go on. People that you work with, all of a sudden the light's going to come on. People in Sydney, Australia, that you don't even know the light switch is going to come on. And the object of all this is for the church to be strategically in position and place to know when it happens. So when it does, we can at least tell them what they ought to do. It's coming whether you believe it or not. It's already starting whether you believe it or not. Are you listening to me? It's already starting whether you believe it or not. There's people right now in spiritual prison houses that are bound by addictions and bound by false doctrine and bound by things. And the angels of God, I don't know if y'all believe in angels around here. I hope you do. I said, I hope you do. Well, you're sitting in church and you can't even reach them. Some of you got backslidden kids. You got backslidden loved ones that are so bound right now. All you can see is the prison they're in and all you can see is the chains on their hands. And the enemy's convinced you they're too far gone. Well, maybe you can't get to them. Man, I feel a little challenge in the Holy Ghost right now. Maybe you can't get to them. But I tell you what you can do, and prayer was made without ceasing unto God for him. You just keep praying. Lord, let that light come on. Let that light come on, God. I bind the spirit of darkness. I feel the Holy Ghost. I bind that spirit of darkness. I bind the chains. <clears throat> I bind the addictions. I bind those habits. I bind it. I bind that false doctrine. I bind that false light. I bind it in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, the end time church has got to be a praying church. I said it's got to be a, you think revival's gonna happen without prayer? You're crazy. The church has got to be praying and while the church is praying, guess what's gonna happen? I, I, you know, I know some of you. Let me tell you a little something. I, I talked about this one time in a revival and after service, a, a, a mother come up to me and she said, Brother Morgan, I, I really want you to pray with me about my daughter. And I said, what's the problem? Well, she got in a custody battle over her children, the court system. She's going through a divorce and she just, she ran off with the kids. We've not seen her in years. She's a backslider and I, I just, I just would like to know she's all right. And I like for God to touch her. She said, would you pray? I said, sure. 
So we agreed together there, standing in the altar area, and we prayed. And so that was on Thursday night. Saturday night, I'm walking into the sanctuary. I'm in the foyer, and that woman's waiting on me. She said, hey, come here. I got to show you something. I said, what? She said, look. You know, I have little windows in the door. And she said, see her? See her right there? I had already forgotten what she was talking about. I said, see who? My daughter. I said, oh. She said, you don't. I said, I said oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She said, Brother Morgan, listen. Wait till you hear what happened. I said, what happened? She said, well, she was in Washington, D.C., living with a man. They'd been traveling from city to city. And I said, but Thursday night, about 1020 Washington, D.C. time, which where we were at was about 920 when we prayed. She said, my daughter was laying in bed with the kids, and this man she was living with was there. And said, all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, get up, pack your clothes, and go home. See, here's our problem. All we can see is chains and bars and how bad the world is. And we can't see where a lot of us, boy, I feel like fighting something right now. A lot of us are like the servant of the prophet. Oh, my God, look at all the enemy. Look at all the horror. I mean, this is horrible. Look how bad everything is. And the old prophet said, okay, God, you're going to have to open his eyes and let him see how this thing really is. And that's where I think that we are. We're looking at the world and how bound they are and how addicted to life they are. And we think, oh, it's too bad. I mean, it's too, many, it's too much enemy and all this stuff and all. But the fact is God needs to open our eyes to let us understand. Are you ready for this one? He died for this world. He wants it to be saved more than you want it to be saved. God have mercy. And God has put some things and the repertoire of the church. Woo. Oh, I understand. I know. I got this one figured out. I've probably told you before, but you know, if I got my theology straight, there's only a third of the angels that fail. See, a lot of us were kind of like the old man in the Old Testament when the prophet appeared to him and said, Set your house in order, or you're going to die. Okay. He starts crying and weeping, turns his face toward the wall. Please, God, help me extend my life. And the prophet's out in the courtyard leaving. God says, go back in there and tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years. And he walks back in. He tells the king, he says, God's going to give you 15 years, Hezekiah. You know what he said? Does anybody know what he said? I, I need a sign. Now, wait a minute. I told you you were going to die. You didn't need a sign. I just told you you're going to live, and now you need one. I'm talking to all of us here right now. We are more prone to see how bound the world is, how evil the world is, how much they're in darkness. Do we not comprehend the power of that light? My God, have mercy. Now listen, listen, I'm going to explain something to you. Now, I think, maybe we, I, did, I don't know if I did this here before, but in the States, they teach us, now I know the, you guys have the metric system here, so I don't know how this is going to work. In the States, if I give you a pie, what kind do you like? Apple? On this fast right now, anything sounds... <laughs> Apple pie. Now, if I cut that apple pie in three pieces and I take one piece out of it and I give it to you, how many pieces are left? Two. two. So there's two good angels for every bad one. Right. Yeah. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Now, see, if I just started talking about you seeing a demon or a devil, you say, oh, man, yeah, I've seen them. I, yeah, man, they've come in my bedroom at night. Matter of fact, I'm married to one. I know I've seen them. <laughs> I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about the one you're married to. 
Oh, yeah, I've seen, everybody here has seen the devil. That's human nature. That's how prone we are. Man, the evil spirit, spirits are trying to take over your family. Yeah, I know, man, it's, it's horrible, it's horrible. But we start talking about angels of God, you're like, mm, I don't know about all that stuff. You know, people, they go crazy and they start talking about angels and they flip out and all this stuff. Well, either they're messengers and either they're sent to the heirs of salvation or they're not. Either there's two good ones for every bad one or not. So all you folks, you got twice as much chance of seeing something good as you do something bad. And I'm trying to preach to you right now that in this end time move that God's going to send some help our way. Let me help some of you right now. That backslidden kid of yours that you think can't make it back, all it takes is an angel just moving his way right down to where they're at and tell them it's time to come on. God said he's heard your mom's prayer and it's time to come home. Those people that you've been praying for that you don't think ever going to break, all it takes is one more prayer meeting. All it takes is the right moment. All it takes is the Holy Ghost saying, this is it. The light's about to come on. Come on, angel. I got a job for you to do. I got a Simon Peter in prison that I need you to get to. I'm trying to preach to you that God wants to do something in Australia. God wants to do something in Fiji. God wants to do something in our nations. God wants to do something in your family. God wants to do something in your community. And the enemy's trying to blind you to it and trying to frustrate you and vex you that it's impossible. I got news for you. There's nothing impossible for God. I'll tell you what you better get ready for. They're called 11th hour workers. They're going to come. Let me ask you a question. What, <laughs> what are you going to do when God deals with entire congregations that's bigger than yours? I passed in probably what is considered one of the most evil cities in the world. San Francisco, California. You say San Francisco, everybody's like, ooh. Hmm. Let me tell you something. Now, maybe I'm crazy. I've lost my mind. But when I went to that city, when I drove into the city limits of San Francisco, we crossed the Bay Bridge, Esker. We was in a van. <laughs> Traffic. <laughs> I pulled right off the side of the road, got out of the van, walked out to the front of the van, and as loud as I could scream, I screamed and said, Devil, I'm here. <laughs> he would say, aren't you intimidated? What, what's there to be intimidated of? Seriously, what's there to be intimidated of? I, 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 oh boy, I got something stirring me. I've had him come to church, come to kill you. We was in revival one time. I mean, the guy come, he had the knife and everything. The only problem was he got about halfway down the aisle. We was in a revival. I mean, everything in the building was getting the Holy Ghost. And if you moved and you were visiting, they was on you with their hands on your head, praying you through whether you wanted it or not. And this guy come through the back doors and started toward the front. They thought he was headed to the altar. <laughs> they got him about middle ways in the aisle, about right here. And they started praying for him. I, I thought he was coming to the altar too. So, man, I just kept the service going. I mean, we was praying people through, people getting the Holy Ghost, being delivered. I mean, they was, you know, swinging from the lights and biting chunks out of the sheet rock and stuff. I mean, it was, it was a crazy Pentecostal church service. Well, it sh probably should be normal. <laughs> and I mean, they got this guy down the center aisle. I mean, they're casting the devils out of him and everything. 
And after the service, the head usher says, we need to talk to you. I said, what? Do you know what this guy come to do? I said, what? He said, he, well, maybe he needs to tell you. I said, okay. So they brought him up to the front. He, I mean, as soon as he walked up, he just starts sobbing. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not talking about some idiot, folks. I'm talking about an intelligent man, a very wealthy man that got involved in all sorts of satanic junk and all. I said, I, I didn't want to do it, but they just, it's, so we know who you are. You know, I'd hate to, I'd hate to go through life and hell not know who I am. Does that make any sense to you? I'd like for the whole spirit realm to talk about me like they did Paul of Jesus. Oh, you better be careful. They'll show, listen, what, what, are we, what are we so intimidated? I'm on something right now. What are we so intimidated about by all this stuff? Either God can do it or he can't do it. Either God is superior or he's not. Either God has all power or he doesn't have it. Either God can keep you or he can't keep you. Either God can protect you or he can't protect you. Somebody needs to make up their mind here tonight and understand how powerful God really is. I don't know why I'm saying this stuff here tonight, but I just feel it. I was in a revival one time, and this, this, anyway, this girl, she, she is a fornicating devil. Is that clear enough for you? And it's one of those services, something just come on, and I just pointed her out and said, you, you, you young lady, you got a little problem. You come up here and pray on the altar, then you leave, pick men up, and you don't even plan on changing. God said, that's it. Eighteen people in the altar needing the Holy Ghost and couldn't even pray them through the Holy Ghost because of her little problem. And God said, that's it. I'm tired of this nonsense. And I said, matter of fact, either you're going to repent or you're going to leave. And if you repent or leave, these people are going to get the Holy Ghost as a sign of this church. What I'm telling you is the truth. Now, what do you want to do? And about that time, her dad decided he's going to come up the center aisle. Now, folks, this, listen, this don't happen all the time. Very rare does it happen. I don't even know why I'm telling the story. And so here comes this big guy up the center aisle. Well, it didn't take me too long to figure out who he was. Now, the same Holy Ghost, it ain't got nothing to do with me, but the same Holy Ghost. I said, sir, I suggest you stop. He paused in the eye. I said, really, you need to stop. Because God's dealing with her, and you're about to mess it up. And the problem is you've got the same spirit your daughter's got. And if you keep coming up that aisle, we're going to have another Acts chapter 5 happen here today. <laughs> now, you can either come on or not. For, personally, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> but I said, you can decide right now. He said, no, I don't want to come any further. I said, that's a good. See, some of you don't believe what I'm talking about right now. Why in the world do we put up with some of this nonsense? Stuff coming into the church and trying to intimidate and trying to rule and trying to wreak havoc. I bind that nonsense in the name of Jesus Christ. God has given us the power over all that stuff. He said, I've given you the power over all unclean. I feel a little help coming to Sydney, Australia right now. I think while we're at this conference, some of you is going to get a little faith restored back to you. And you're going to recognize, hey, God's going to go back with me. And there's some things about to change. And there's some things about to happen. Woo. Well, we, just, we just can't get a break. Keep praying. I'm closing. Keep praying. It just, it just seemed like it's so hard. Where's our missionaries? Somebody said missionaries are here. Where's our missionaries? In 30 seconds, it can all change. It can all change. Where are you at? What, what country? Australia. 30 seconds, it can all change. 30 seconds, it can all change. 30 seconds, it can all change. Some of you don't believe that. 30 seconds, it can all change. All it takes is the word from a king. 30 seconds, it can change. 
30 seconds, your kid can change. 30 seconds, your city can change. 30 seconds where there's been resistance. You don't believe me? Let me ask you one question. How long does it take to say these words? Come out of him. Seriously, how long? How long? How long? How long do you think the devil had put in the man of Gadara? How many years do you think he had invested in him? You want to talk about the power of God versus the power of the enemy? First of all, the devil is not the opposite of God. God doesn't have an opposite. God and the devil's not in some boxing match to see who can win. Calvary was not about God proving to the devil he could beat him. Calvary was about your victory. I said it was about your victory. Your victory. Not God's victory. It was your victory. Here I stop. How long do you think it took? How long, does it, how long does it take to say that? Years of making that man just like he was. Keeping, they tried to chain him. They tried to send him to AA. Y'all have AA here? They tried to send him to AA. They sent him to Devil, Demoniac, Anonymous Clubs. They, they sent him everywhere they could send him, and he'd just break the chains. Years of investment by the enemy. He was a trophy of hell. Whoo. But the same God who calmed the sea. Why in the world do you think the devil, the demoniac of Gadara, was waiting on Jesus when he got out of the boat? Because if you know the story, he lived on the coast. And he knew about storms. And he knew that storms don't just stop. They subside. They don't just stop. But he knew whatever stopped that storm can stop the storm raging in me. And I want to see what's coming out of that storm. And when that boat come up there, he knew what's ever in that boat stopped that storm. And when Jesus got out of the boat, he was waiting on him. And the Bible says he fell at his feet and he worshiped him. Don't tell me you can't worship God tonight because of your petty little problem. You just don't know what I'm fighting. I got news for you. You ain't got the problems that boy had. The term legion mean he had several thousands of devils. And he fell at his feet and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, come out of him. Now, how long does this say take to say? Come on, somebody time it. How long? One and a half seconds. That's about right. One and a half seconds. What it took hell years to accomplish, to build, to set, to set up, to model. To point his finger at the power of, of hell. One and a half seconds is all it took Jesus. Come out of him. And even the devil said, hey, 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 hang on. Before we come out, where can we go? These guys that are so bad are asking permission to Jesus. Where can we go? There's some pigs over here. See, people, listen to me. Pigs won't even put up with what some of you will. Because when those devils got on those pigs, the Bible says they drove themselves into the sea and said, we weren't created for this. We'd rather drown in the sea than have this living with us. And some of you are going to go right back home tonight putting up with the same demonic activity. And the Holy Ghost is here tonight telling you, I can change it in about one and a half seconds. I'm starting to feel a little faith coming here right now. I can change your dilemma in about one and a half seconds. I can heal your body in about one and a half seconds. I can deliver you from the addiction in about one and a half seconds. All it takes is for you to acknowledge that the light's coming on and for you to worship me and it can happen. Woo! That's it. That's it. 
Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I forgot. There's another part of that story a lot of us don't know. Matthew records there were two that came, but only one was delivered. Two in the same service, two sitting next to each other, two at the same turning point conference, and only one of them was delivered. I think it was the one that went to worship it and believed. The light just come on. I see the glory of God in the face of that man. I see my deliverance right now. I see my healer right now. You got a choice. You can either leave here changed or you can leave here with a veil over it because of your unbelief. I choose to believe tonight. I choose to believe. Woo. I'm waiting on some of you to catch up. I choose to believe. The light's about to come on for somebody. It's a light of understanding. I don't have to stay in this dilemma. I don't have to stay here. I'm fixing to open this altar. I, I can come out of this. I can come out of this. I don't have to stay here. I can worship God in spite of my situation. I can bless the Lord at all times. It doesn't matter what's going on. I see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to worship Him. My situation's not, come on, anybody come to this conference to worship God? Are you ready? Seriously, are you ready? Let me tell you, let me tell you a little something here. You ready? If you're sitting next to somebody that the light comes on and they start realizing what God's about to do for them, it could get a little dangerous. Because I've been in crusades and meetings where I've seen it happen and they literally start climbing over the pews trying to get out of that pew. Because all of a sudden they realize my miracle's in the building right now. I've been praying for this for too long. The Word of God just gave me some hope. You know what? I, I, I feel say something here. Just, just, just say this in the Holy Ghost. You need to quit magnifying what you call a curse on your family. Let me ask you a question. When you've got the Holy Ghost, you don't think the Holy Ghost is more powerful than that curse? But all you can see is the spiritual and the demonic stuff and all. You need the light to come on and you need to get a revelation of the power of Jesus Christ and what happens. He said, behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing, and nothing shall by any means harm you. I need this to I pastored 10, I know I keep going, but I pastored 10 years in the heart of Native American country, Indians, American Indians. We've had the medicine men come to church. We've had them come to put spells. Seriously. Can I tell you a quick story? Sunday morning, I'm getting ready to teach my adult Bible class. And I'm coming out of my office, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you won't be teaching today. You're going to preach. And you're going to preach about Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel. And I want you to challenge them to bring their gods to the front. So I got out there and I said, church, we're not, I'm not going to be teaching today. We're, going to be, we're just going to have service. I did not see the young medicine man. Now the problem is we prayed his mother through the Holy Ghost and had baptized her. And so when she got ready for church that morning, he was downstairs waiting on her. He had his whole deal on, had his medicine pouch. 
And he told his mom, I'm going to church today. I'm going to prove to you that God of the white man's nothing. I didn't see him. I was preaching. I'm telling you, the place is going crazy. And finally, he steps out in the center aisle. It's the first time I've seen him. He steps out in the center aisle. He's got his little medicine pouch. He's got his medicine. And he's sprinkling whatever it is he's sprinkling. He's coming down the aisle doing his little, hey, uh, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, uh, yeah. And I said, bring him on up here. Bring him on up here. Get your God on up here. I promise you before God, it looked like something picked that boy up off his feet and took him back to his pew and slammed him on that pew. And, and when it did, <laughs> and I said, come on, son. You, you having a problem getting your God on up here? Bring him on up here. Get him on up here. Get him on up here. Now, do you get people think when this light comes on that they're going to find some weak, anemic God behind it? So he gets that back out in the aisle, and he tries the second time. Same thing. I said, come on, bring him on up here. Picks him up, slams him in the pew. When it did the second time, a man was sitting behind him. He looked up and said, if you guys would get this off me, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> So he gets up, he runs out the back doors, he left. That's Sunday morning. Sunday night, we're in song service, having worship service. And the back doors bust open, here he come. I thought, well, here's round two. And so I come off the platform, and he just running full steam. Well, this time he didn't have his medicine pouch, he didn't have none of that stuff. He slides in the altar, and he throws his hands up. He starts screaming as loud as he could. Deliver me from this darkness. Deliver me. Woo! That night that boy was delivered, was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. He happens to be a one God Jesus' name preacher right now. I'm telling somebody, this God that you're about to experience, he's not weak and he's not anemic. I said he's not weak and he's not anemic. He's all powerful. Christianity never was intended to be a weak religion. I pray for the power of God to come in here right now. I pray for the delivering power of Jesus Christ to come into this building right now. 